Join us for a time of quiet prayer and meditation as we prepare to worship the Lord. Our help in the name of the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. Amen. We have a few announcements this morning. First, for those parents who are waiting on kids to come back from the junior high or middle school retreat, uh, they uh, have just left and they should be here at 110 according to uh, the computer that tells you what time you're going to be there. So about 110, 115, the children should be back from uh, the middle school retreat. Uh, we do want to welcome everybody to church this morning as we gather for worship. A couple of announcements. One not in your bulletin that's very important is the Dinner for Eight. Uh, this is something we're, we started a year ago, has been very successful, with, but we want everyone to be a part of it. I know people say, I don't have time. Well, you make time for what's important, and I'm telling you, this is important. Because if we're going to be together as a family of God, we need to know one another. And as we grow, we need to be growing to know each other in the church. So I would encourage you to sign up for the Dinner for Eight. Uh, that sign-up sheet is outside this church office. Um, Corinne's going to come forward for a short announcement on the poinsettia. You're going to get a chance this year to help the decorating committee decorate our sanctuary for Christmas. And I know you're really excited about that. Because some of you say, oh, I don't have that gift. Well, guess what? This year you can help us by purchasing a poinsettia in memory or in honor of someone. You will see the form in your bulletin. And you'll see you can do at least five or six or however many you would like. And they are going to be $12.50. They're going to be good quality and nice big plants. At the bottom also, if you'll notice, it says, I will pick up my plant on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, how about Christmas, December the 23rd, or I will not be able to pick mine up. So you can take it on the 23rd, and if you did it in honor of someone, you might want to take it to them. And if you did it in memory, you can just take it to your house or whoever and enjoy it. So there's a bag right out here with the poinsettia on it. So fill this out. Um, Checks, uh, let's see, I guess they're going to be made to the church, if that's okay. So if, if it's otherwise, I'll let you know, and thank you very much. I don't know if it was that good, Karen, but it was pretty good, though, wasn't it? She had a lot of enthusiasm, but what she didn't tell you, all the, all the ones that you leave, we're going to, you what? Oh, you are? Well, we'll talk about that later, okay? All right, please make a note of the poinsettias, and please help us decorate the church for Christmas with poinsettias this year. Um, lunch Bunch, we are going this, Sunday, uh, this Tuesday, not 
Usually it's the second Tuesday. This week, this month, it's going to be on Tuesday, November the 6th, Election Day. So go vote and come eat lunch, or come eat lunch and then go vote. Uh, but we're going to be at Mully's at 11.30. Officer nominations, if you have somebody you want to nominate for an officer, please see myself or Buddy Lever or Richard Crawford, but you need to do that today as we're meeting tonight. Um, also, a thank you to everyone who helped with Fall Festival, especially Lori and Richard, who took on the leadership of that. She's saying Richard, but I know Lori had a lot to do with it, too, and a lot of other people who step up and help make that very, a very good event. Let's uh, prepare our hearts now to worship the Lord as um, we come to give Christ honor and glory on his day. stand for the call to worship. The call to worship comes from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come and we bless you, the one who does not fail us, who does not disappoint us, who does not betray us, but whose love is perfect and wonderful and constant and evident. Father, we come into your presence and we give praise to you. And we pray that you would help us to obey your word that we would worship according to your word, that we would worship by your spirit and in truth. Father, bless us as we come. Father, as we come now, we use the words of Christ as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You be seated. Take your red hymnal. We'll sing um, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah, which is a version of Psalm 148 in the Red Trinity Hymnal. Number 110. <laughs>
with me as we now come and confess our, our sin through the common prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Let us pray together. We freely confess our sins before you, Lord. You know it before we confess it, for your eye sees not only our sinful actions, but our sinful thoughts as well. You know not only the sins of our hands, but the sins of our hearts. Though we be without hope in ourselves, you have given us your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would forgive us our sins, give us victory over them through our Son and to his glory. Amen. If you pray that in truth in your heart, hear the assurance of pardon we find from Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that was before its sharer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Amen. <laughs> Father in heaven, we come before you and we give thanks that you are a God who has blessed us with so much. And we pray now, Father, that you would take our tithes and offerings. Father, help us not be a people who would rob God in his own house, but let us be a people who takes the word of God seriously, who takes the need of the church and this world seriously. Bless us as we give. Bless us as we give with a cheerful heart. And may it be used for your glory in the building of your kingdom. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated.
going now and we confess that which we believe. We confess who we believe in. And we confess it with the ancient creed, the Apostles' Creed. Christians, I ask you, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You take your Psalter. We'll sing number 143B, O Lord, my spirit fails, 143B. seated. You turn with me in your Bibles, or the Pew Bible, to 1 Samuel 6, as we have our scripture reading from there today. 1 Samuel 6, let us hear God's word. The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, what shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us what we sh tell, us, tell us with what we shall send it to its place. They said, If you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return him a guilt offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known that to you why his hand does not turn away from you. And they said, What is the guilt offering that we shall return? They answered, five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the numbers of the Lord of the Philistines. For the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. So you must make images of your tumors and images of your mice that ravage the land and give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from off of you and your gods and your land. Why should you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts after he had dealt severely with them? Did they not send the people away and they departed? 
Now then take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows on which there has never become a yoke. And yoke the cows to the cart, but take their calves home away from them. And take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart and put a, in a box at its side the figures of gold, which you are returning to him as a guilt offering. Then send it off and let it go its way and watch. If it goes on, up on the way to its own land, to Beth Shemesh, then it is he who has done us this great harm. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that is struck, as it has happened by coincidence. The men did so, and they took two milk cows and yoked them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they put the Ark of the Covenant on the cart and with, and with the box of the golden mice and the images of their tumors. And the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh along one highway, lowing as they went. They turned neither to the right nor to the left, and the lords of the Philistines went after them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and when they lifted their eyes, they saw the ark, and they rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stopped there. A great stone was there, and they split up the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the box that was beside it, in which were the golden figures, and they set them upon the great stone. And the men of Beshemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices on that day to the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines saw it, they returned that day to Ekron. These are the golden tumors that the Philistines returned as a guilt offering to the Lord, one for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, and one for Ekron. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and unwalled villages. The great stone beside which they sat down at the ark of the Lord is a witness to this day in the field of Joshua of Beshemesh. And he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 men of them. And the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. Then the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And to whom shall he go up away from us? Then they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kirath Jerim and said, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord come down and take it up to you. The reading of God's word. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you and we are thankful for your word and we are thankful that you give us stories that illustrate your power and your goodness. Father, we thank you for this story which, is, uh, which gives us a lot to think about. As we think about your heavy hand upon the Philistines, we think about their own testing of the waters to make sure that this had come from you and how they set up a test which clearly showed you had brought the, the, the tumors and the mice. And Father, we see that you're a holy God not only to your enemies but even to your people and that we are to obey you and follow you and be in awe of you for there is no God like our God. There are no deities like our great, one, true, and living God. Father, we come before you as your people, and we are in awe. May we live by the power of your grace, by the mercy of your love, by Christ and his gospel. May we come, and may we be found righteous in him. Father, we come and we pray for revival in our church, in the world. Father, we pray that you would help us, that our love for Jesus would lead us to become more serious about our following Christ, that this would lead to consistency in our worship, our giving, and our work. Father, we pray for our elections that are coming up, we pray that you would give us wisdom as we go into the voting booth. Father, bless those who are elected by our nation, our county, our state, and may you use them according to your plan and your will. 
to do good for your people and glorify your name. We pray, Father, you would help us to be disciples, that we would follow those habits, that we would walk with Christ. We pray for new officers. We pray for our new elders and deacons that will be elected at the end of this year, and we pray that they might be mightily used by you within our congregation and, again, within our ministry here in Lancaster. We pray for our staff. We pray for our children. We pray, Father, that you would bring new people into this church, and we're thankful for the ones who have come in. And we pray for events like Dinner for Eight that allow us to get to know one another and bind us together over table fellowship. Father, bless us. Bless us as we gather in Sunday school. Bless us as we gather on Wednesday nights. Father, bless your people as we gather. Add to their numbers. Strengthen your church. Father, we come and we pray thanking you for our fall festival. And we pray for those contacts that we made, and we pray, Father, that you might lead them here, but, Father, we also just pray you would lead your people here, that you would hear our prayers for our ten list, hear our prayers for those that we engage in the world. Father, hear our prayers for our missing sheep here at First ARP. Father, we need revival. We need to take seriously the things of God. Father, show us our, sh our sin. Not that we can be guilty. We know we are guilty. Show us our sin that we might kill it, let it be, lest it be killing us. Bring revival. Bring revival. Fill us with your spirit and make us more like Christ. Father, we come and we pray for our sister churches. We remember the Hopewell Church in Blackstock. We remember IBL, Spanish-speaking ministry church in Columbia. We lift these up to you. We pray for Montage Church in Los Angeles. It, it is getting underway with Leon now. We pray blessing on him in these first few weeks and months. We remember Ben Carver at Shim Creek, Matt Autry at King's Cross, excuse me, King's Church. Father, we pray for our college students. And in this very difficult time of life, we pray that you would be with them, that they would not drift away from you and your church, but that they would take very seriously Christ. Father, in all this we come and we lift up our prayers in the strong name of the one who makes prayer possible, the one who is our mediator, the one who who intercedes for us. We thank you that you have made a way, and that way is Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. The children will come forward for the children's sermon. What's up, guys? Are y'all on sugar high still? No. So y'all have a day out of school today, uh, this week, right? Why do we have a day out of school? Is there a holiday? Is it what? Election day. They let y'all out of school for election day? Are you going to vote? Eighteen or older. You're not eighteen yet? Okay. Ten more years watching you. So what are you gonna do on your day off? What you gonna do? Myra Jean doesn't get a day off, she's homeschooled. That's okay. You get to watch some election stuff, right? All right. We have a government found a lot like the church here. You know, we have state, we have local, state, and federal government. We were able to vote for representatives who represent us. We are a, re we are a republic. We are representatives, right? Uh, we don't generally vote on everything, right? That would be a disaster, right? 
vote people to go and do it for us, right? In the church, though, it's interesting. Who's the head of the church? Okay. More specifically, Jesus. Christ is the Christ crowning covenant. That was the old rally cry of the covenanters, which is the R in ARP. So we're actually part of a monarchy. What is that? What does a monarchy have? Have y'all not had civics yet? Are you only eight? Okay. Monarchy has a king. Jesus is our king, right? Now, we don't particularly like kings in America because we find that kings are difficult. We had a, we had a problem with one about 200-something years ago, right? Because he wasn't doing right. Now, do we have a problem with King Jesus? Why? He's good, but he's also what? He's God, so he's perfect. So we don't have to worry about an abusive, tyrannical king in Jesus because he loves us. How do we know King Jesus loves us? What are some reasons we know Jesus loves us? He died. He died on the cross to take away our sins. How else do we know Jesus loves us? He tells us in the Bible. How else do we know Jesus loves us? Anything? Your parents, your church, your friends, your clothes, your dogs, everything good in your life comes from who? That's right. So he's a good king. And we need to worship him, but we also need to follow him, right? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for King Jesus. We thank you that he rules over this world. And we look forward to the day that he comes back again and that he makes his kingdom perfect and, and sets all, rights, all wrongs right and sets everything straight in this world. Father, we pray for these young ones that they would understand who King Jesus is and that their life would be dedicated to Christ and that they would live for him and they would follow him they would deny themselves and take up the cross that they would do this seeing who Jesus is we pray it in Christ's name Amen thank y'all If you turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 8, we are continuing in our look of the idea of trusting in the Lord. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38, trusting God means following Jesus and not yourself. Jesus here speaks a high, um, Jesus here speaks words to his people about what it means to be a follower. Before we read these words, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come today and we give praise to you that you are God and in you we put our complete trust as our King, our Lord, our Creator, and Redeemer. Father, now speak to us through your word. And build us up and glorify yourself. For we come in the strong name of Christ. Amen. Mark 8, begin with verse 34 through the end of the chapter. Let us hear God's word. And calling the crown to him, excuse me, and calling the crowd to himself to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lo- will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, and the Gospels will save it. For what, does it profit a, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of God also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Amen. 
You are called to die. You are called to die. This is not the tagline that we want for Christianity. You're called to die. We prefer a tagline of victory in Jesus. We prefer we are more than conquerors. We prefer there will be showers of blessing. Yet these come only after we die to ourselves. Our sister church here in town, Second Baptist, has stickers. Have you seen their stickers? They say, I am second. Have you seen those? Now, if you're not careful, you might misunderstand what they're saying there. Many folks might miss the theological message of that sticker. When they say, I am second, they are putting Christ first. We, as first ARP, we might have stickers that say, he is first. And it would be the same idea. Being a Christian means that your whole life is now reoriented. Your desires, your priorities, your goals are now Christ-focused, Christ-driven, Christ-inspired. For you are no longer your own. You are Christ. He has brought, bought you with his own blood. He has paid the price of your sin, which you had no hope of doing. Now you must follow him because there is nowhere else to go. You realize that there's no other place to go. Either we follow Jesus, dying to ourselves, or we reject Jesus and we live for ourselves. Now, Jesus isn't calling us to go be martyrs here, although we might be called to be martyrs. But he is saying that he must come first in our lives. And that there is no other option. Look at our passage today. Is this not clear here in this passage? This is why we must completely trust in the Lord because salvation calls for a complete trust. Trust in the Lord here and now. Trust in the Lord not only for heaven, but in the face of opposition, hatred, and suffering now because you follow Christ. Now look at the passage. First thing that we see, that this is all of us. This is all of us. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, and calling the crowd. Notice that Jesus gathers the whole crowd to himself. This is not just for the apostles. It's not just for pastors and elders. This is for every Christian. And if we're not very careful, we like to, as, as sinful beings, we like to reason or think our way out of it being about us. Do we not? Someone should do something about that. Someone should do something about this issue or this problem or this need. And we look outside of ourselves rather than what we can do to meet the needs that we see. This is for every Christian. It is for our youngest Christians. Most of those are at the middle school retreat. It's for our oldest Christians. It's for those working and for those retired. It is for you if you call yourself a Christian. This message that Jesus has here, calling us to put him first and to die to ourselves. These are words for all of you who claim to be a Christian. Now, as we think about our governments, a lot of us are thinking about government this week as elections are coming up. The government allows for many distinctions. If we went around and we looked at your tax form, probably many different tax brackets are here, right? 
We don't have a 10% or a 20%, but we have a variety of tax brackets. The more money you make, the more money the government takes. So in some ways, our tax laws are not for everyone, in a sense. There's different rules for small businesses versus large corporations. These are good or bad. They're just different. That's my point. Yet there are certain laws that are supposed to apply to all people. Traffic laws, laws that protect life and property. Everyone is called to follow those. Here Jesus is saying something that applies to all people. It's not just for one group. It's not just for one age or sex. It is for everyone who would come after him. So understand that I am talking to you this morning. Whether you be Myra Jean and Taylor, they're probably the youngest ones here, or and, and whoever's the oldest, I won't call you out. I'm talking to you. Jesus is talking to you. Will you listen? The second thing we see is the message is self-denial. If you would come after Jesus, you'll deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, follow Jesus. Again, it doesn't make for a good marketing campaign, does it? We all want, we all want of God's, we want his hope, we want his love, we want his blessing, but we do not want to see that these come through self-denial. Self-denial is a, almost a bad word in our age, is it not? The world doesn't deny self, but yet think about some of the benefits, just real quickly. There's some benefits to self-denial at the dinner table, isn't there? If you would be healthier, you're going to have to practice self-denial. There's some benefits to self-denial with your credit card and with your checking account. And there's some benefits to self-denial with your calendars and your appointment book. The world does not li believe in self-denial. Some now will have a distorted view of it. Some will, uh, some will deny many of the blessings that God has given us to be enjoyed in order to, quote, be self-denying. We had a guy at Erskine who took this way too literally, and he got rid of all of his stuff, I mean all of his stuff, he had a blanket and a pillow, and he slept on the tile floor of the dorm. That didn't last real long, by the way. But that's not what God is talking about. That's what not, Jesus is not talking about that. And we could go off on a tangent about why that's not exactly right. In fact, maybe even the opposite of what he's saying. But what we get mainly in this world is you are worth it. You deserve it. You're not going to be happy without it. And the world tells you not to wait. You have to have it. And so they give you credit cards with high limits. The world tells you you can't be happy without it. And that everyone else has one too. The world tells you you can't be happy unless you get to this level of success or to this level of achievement or to this or that, whatever. So we have these external pressures pushed upon us. We have these things that if you watch TV and just watch, you know, Christmas is coming, right? Have y'all noticed that? Have you not? I'm serious. Have you noticed it? Go to Walmart. What do you see? Go to Aldi. I bought a Christmas tree this week. $20 Christmas tree. Aldi. It's artificial. Don't tell anybody. Watch children's television. Christmas is coming. And they're hitting it hard. You have to have this or this. Watch teenage shows. You have to have this or this. Look on the internet. Watch what starts coming across your Facebook feed and see if it's not shopping related items, Christmas related items. And if we're not careful, we don't even know that we're being bombarded with these messages. The world is telling us one thing. 
But you know, that's not the biggest problem we have. Our own sinfulness tells us that we should have what we want. See, it's not just a matter of us fighting against the world. It's about us fighting our own selves. It's our own self that doesn't want Christ to be king of our life. And there's the struggle. And here's the real rub. That our fight is often against ourselves. It's against our pride. It's against our comfort. It is our... It's against our desires. And it's against the idea of losing our respect, even. These we are called to deny for the sake of Christ. To follow Christ is going to kill your pride. It's going to take away some of your comfort, if not all your comfort. It's going to put you in uncomfortable situations. Your desires die and must come in line with Christ's desires. And just as Christ was disrespected, we can imagine we will be disrespected as we follow Christ in this world. These we are called to deny for Christ's sake. Look what Christ says in verse 35. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. The idea here is whoever would deny Jesus and his gospel to save his life, whether literally to save his life, his physical life, or to save his business, or to save his comfort, or to save his reputation, or to save his worldly possessions, or to save anything, Jesus says, if you deny me for those things, you will lose your life. Those who are willing to lose everything for Jesus, they will find their life. Though they lose their family, their opportunities, their respect, their honor, even life itself. But they will gain eternal life with God, and nothing compares to that. Veterans Day is coming up this month. It's unfortunate that's not a bigger day. We have many in our congregation, I've had many in my family who have served And it's good that we honor those men and women who have served in our armed forces. But I think we all would agree that Memorial Day is more important. Veterans Day honors all that served. Memorial Day honors those who gave all in their service. What Jesus is saying is that we're not just to serve. We are to give our all in following him. We are to die to ourselves. We are to lose our life. We are to lose the sinful, messed up life that we might find real life in Jesus. Have you lost your life that you can find your life? Or do you still hold on to dead living? Jesus adds an eternal element to this argument. What if a man gained the whole world? Think about gaining the whole world. Alexander came close. He conquered the known world. Napoleon was master of Europe and parts of Asia. Hitler conquered most of Europe and North Africa. Think about the great rich people of the world. We could name them, couldn't we? Think about the super famous people in the world. What is their end? What is their end? What is their end in such a short time? Is it not the same as yours? They have great riches, fame, and power, but their time is short, the Bible says, in the blinking of an eye. Hear what Matthew Henry says. Listen closely. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world by denying Christ and forfeiting his soul? True it is that life is sweet and death is bitter, but eternal death is more bitter and eternal life is more sweet. The gain of all the world in sin is not sufficient to counterbalance the ruin of the soul by sin. 
Do you have a price? Do you have a price? If the devil came and made you an offer, what would you take for your soul? There are many examples in story and movies and plays and such. Faust, this comes to mind, Faust made a pact with the devil, exchanging his soul for unlimited knowledge and worldly pleasures. If you like blues, you've probably heard of Robert Johnson. Any blues fans here? Anybody ever see, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? You saw Tommy, that was based on Robert Johnson, who supposedly met the devil at midnight on a crossroads in Mississippi and sold his soul to the devil to be able to play the blues guitar. What would you sell your soul for? What would it be worth? You know, I fear that many people in this world, they sell their soul far too cheaply. What if you could have whatever you wanted? What if the devil offers you those, you know, the genie wishes? What, I'll give you three wishes. What would you give for your soul? So many give it away for cheap thrills of this life. Yet I hope many of you recoil from this offer. For you know that you're the great value of your soul. You know there is nothing in this world worth your soul. No, not even the whole world is worth giving up your eternal soul. Listen to verse 36 and 37. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? You hear Jesus. And he's clear. Listen to what he says at the end. And for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in his glory of his Father with his holy angels. Well, if your soul is important enough that you're not going to sell it out, if you're going to deny yourself and you're going to follow Jesus, then you have to prepare to suffer in this life with Jesus. There is no middle ground. You must be with Jesus or you must be with the world. One of the most horrible scenes in the miniseries Band of Brothers to me, which was heartbreaking in many ways, was when they, took the, when they liberated a Dutch town. And as the army came in, there was a great celebration. The Americans had come. The Nazis who had been there for years had been pushed out. And there was celebrating all around. But then you saw bands of men coming around. They had been the resistance. And they started grabbing women and they started grabbing men who had fraternized with the Nazis, who had helped the Nazis, who had aided the enemy. And they shaved the women's heads and they shot many of the men. And they turned these shaven-headed women out with their children. You see, you could not be forgiven by the Dutch for aiding an enemy like the Nazis. So clearly, you cannot aid the world against Christ. You cannot deny who you are in Christ. You can't fail to stand for Christ and his gospel and his world, word in this world. If you choose comfort over truth, if you choose respect of men over Christ, then do not be surprised when he denies you on that late, that great last day. For if you are ashamed of Christ now, then he will be ashamed of you when he comes. My dear friends, we love to have that trust in the Lord with all our hearts. We love to have that sign in our kitchen, in our living room, maybe on our door, on our desk. Maybe it's the cover photo for our Facebook page. Yet to trust in the Lord means that we must die to self. It means we must love Jesus more than the world, more than ourselves. And we must be willing to suffer with his people in this world. Yet how is it worth it? 
Well, look at your life. Are you selling your soul cheap? Are you willing to give up your life, any part of it, or even all of it, for something in this world rather than Christ? This is what following Jesus really looks like. You are second. He is first. Is this what your life looks like? If not, then you need to repent and turn to Christ. Just as Peter was restored from his three times denying Christ, so can your life be restored to God even now. Know, however, that just as Peter's life was changed, so will yours be changed as he becomes first and you become second. But this is all for good, that we might gain eternal life in heaven and with Christ, to give up the cheap and perishing things of this world, to gain the priceless and eternal things of Christ, both now and forevermore. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come today, and we pray that you would help us not to sell our soul cheaply, not to sell our soul at all. For though the devil offer us all fame, all power, all possessions in this world, it is but a cheap thing compared to our soul and an eternity in glory with our wonderful God, our Savior, our Creator. Father, work in our hearts that we might deny ourselves that we might take up our cross and that we might follow you in every area, every crack and uh, every, every little bit of our life, every corner, every crack of our life would be dedicated to following Christ. For we come and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. If you take your red Trinity hymnals, we'll sing number 562, all to Jesus I surrender. 562 as we stand and sing.
The message is clear. There's a free offer of the gospel. It is truly free. You can't earn it. You can't do anything to save yourself. It is freely given what Christ has done, but what Christ does demand in return is that a man pick up his cross, deny himself, and follow Christ. Or as we've just seen, all to Jesus we surrender. This you can do by faith. This you can do by the help of God. This you must do to be his people. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Thank you.